spring is amongst us, the season of spring, of course, and the summer season is just about ready to begin. I took a little break because I've been touring too. I love touring. I was in Asia and Australia. I was hiding from all of you, but not really hiding because I was showing you through pictures, Kodak moments as we used to call them back in the day, <laughs> taking pictures with my camera. And sharing them with all of you around the world of how, how we live, what we do, what we eat. It's incredible how I've all, you know, I had a conversation with another peer of mine and we talked about Twitch and a few bits like what this thing, the camera phone, the smartest thing on the planet what it does. And, and we were talking about, imagine in the nineties or even the late eighties and nineties, when we were all playing out, traveling, starting to travel and DJ around the world, when this thing was starting to explode and begin, because uh, granted, we can go back to the beginning of DJing in 1970, 69, 68, or even go back to the forties to, to regime, to re the woman regime who opened up cafe regime in Paris and then opened up regime's discotheque. We could always talk about, it. but imagine if this thing was there, you know, recording our moments every second, right? But the leaders of the new school who I'm going to bring up shortly was blessed to have with her at all times, this little boxy thing called the smartphone. First up, before I introduce the show, I want to thank Defected Records, Faith Magazine for including me in their special this month. My article of me back in the day playing started out, I always say everyone has a beginning, including me. So I like to call myself an OG. And what I mean by OG, meaning old goat, because I am an old goat. <laughs> so hit up Defected Store and also the Journey into Sound piece. I talk about all the systems in New York City from right from the 80s into the 90s. Junior Vasquez's booth at Sound Factory, Steve Dash. Oh, God. Brian Wilson. Everybody I talked to. I tried to, to hit everybody up. In there is also Barbara Tucker's story with Don Welch, Underground Network, Tony Humphreys, Risa Garcia. There's so many New York moments in faith. Once again, let me show the cover. Go to Defected Store to get your free copy. And I said the word magically free. Oh my God, it's free. Yes, it is free. How much does it cost? It's free. So please support the cause to Faith Magazine and of course Defected because they're doing a great job over there with their world tours. And welcome to True House Stories. I'm Lenny Fontana coming out of New York City, fresh and ready for today. And I said it before and I'll say it again. Everyone has a beginning. And this woman has a very strong beginning. It's a real beginning. A beginning where you talk about women breaking through and no matter what it takes to get that dream to come true, you do what you have to do. Madonna proved that. Madonna was one of those that, you know, just on this note alone, she finished her record and she slept in the office area of WKTU, Disco 92, New York City, and waited for someone to get to play her record. And they did. I don't have to tell you the rest is history. She's on her 40th anniversary tour. But this woman right here, Sam Devine, Defected Records, has championed with her torch in one hand and her lightsaber in the other. While someone's recording her with a box phone, right? Making sure that we see every movement she does, because I'll tell you, she's one of the most, I'm going to say one of the most photographed and video women I've seen for as a DJ. So I got to give it up and thank God she's doing it. I want to welcome to the True House Stories family and the show, 
Miss Sam, delicious divine. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> diggity, diggity, dig. Sam, wow. Sam. What an intro, Lenny. Thank you so much. <laughs> I tell you, I'm ready for the Tonight Show. There's a big strike going on here with the writers in L.A. I would take a Tonight Show position immediately if they allowed me in. <laughs> if they would allow me in, I would take it in a heartbeat. Love 100%. That. Love that. How's, how are you doing and, and how are how is everything going? Great. Really, really good. I've just moved into a new house. I feel like, you know, we were just discussing before I've been living out. Well, I've been pretty much living out of a suitcase my whole career. Um, but yeah, moved move from London. I've been in London 17 years and finally settled up north. And yeah, everything's good. I wake up to like, you know, nature every morning and it's just, uh, you know, my bedroom overlooks the golf course and just all the trees and the blossom trees. And yeah, it's just a, dis di a whole different vibe now living up north. Um, but I'm here for it. It's my time to kind of, I mean, settle down in my life. I'm Far from settling down in my career, I feel like I'm just getting started. 21 years deep and uh, still loving it, still every day, like something amazing happens. So, yeah, I've just uh, laid, laid my hat up north now. So I feel very chilled. I've just been on a spa for two days, so farmhouse and had lots of treatments and nice food and chilling out. And, yeah, so I'm very chilled today, Lenny. Normally I'm like ah, 100 miles an hour, but I'm super chilled today. Did you plan it like that? To, to move up here? No, to be chilled out knowing you were coming on the show. Oh, well, I, do you know what? I, I always I always try and chill out. Um, it just depends on my day. But my management kind of gave me a personal day today. So, yeah, tomorrow I'll be back to it, I'm sure. Listen, a lot of people would love to be in your position, you know, and it's a wonderful feeling to have that. So we must congratulate you for all the accomplishments Thank you. you have made happen. You know what I'm saying for yourself? And let's just start like this. You know, I always ask one question. And of course, I'll ask others accordingly to what we need. But we want to know the young, young girl with the pigtails. <laughs> Where did you see that picture? <laughs> I saw the picture with the braces and everything. I saw it all. Are you yeah, see it my mom. <laughs> Mr. Vine, I need your daughter's pictures. The, <laughs> wait, 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 wait. I need her asset package from <laughs> 1988. All that stuff that she would have had at that time. We want to see all that stuff. 1992. Yep. So she's got them all. She's got them all. Wow. Okay. So we always ask and going to politely ask you as a wonderful female coming up the ranks, how does music find you or you find the music as a young kid? Where does this journey take you? So, I mean, for me, I've always grown up around music. My mom loved music. So whenever she was getting ready for work, I mean, my mom had like three jobs. Um, so she always had music on in the house. She's a lorry driver. So she would always have music on in the, in, in the truck. And it just felt like from the moment I woke up to the moment that I went to sleep, there was always music and laughter and love in our house. My first album that I ever bought was Tina Turner, Steamy Windows, when I was seven years old. Um, and I've probably still got it rattling around somewhere, but that album was just a game changer for me. You know, I, I, I saved up all my pocket money, went to Woolworths, um, and that kind of led on, you know, every Saturday I would get, you know, like a, a, a few pounds, um, a week for pocket money and I would just go to all of and buy whatever the number one single was in the charts. I'd listen to the Radio 1 Top 40. Um, I had a little cassette player and I would stop when, you know, the presenter was speaking. And so I'd just literally just be making mixtapes from probably from the age of, yeah, from like six or seven. Yeah, six or seven probably making mixtapes. But I never really knew that I wanted to be a DJ. I was always... I loved clubbing. I loved going out and, and hearing other DJs play. And there was kind of like a turning point for me. I was in Bristol 
and there was a DJ called Lisa Pinup. And I just remember it was, um, I was led or just sat over looking at, over her at the balcony. And for two hours, I could not take my eyes off her. The way she conducted the crowd and how she had everyone eating out of the palm of her hands. And I literally went away from that night and I was like, okay. I, I want to be a DJ. At the time I was doing little bits and pieces of modeling. Um, my mom just said to me that I, I came home and I was like, mom, I don't want to be a model anymore. I want to be a DJ. Um, and she, she, I mean, she supported it in the fact because she thought it was going to be a phase, right? As all parents do, they think, okay, ah, my child wants to play music in loud nightclubs. Um, and yeah, I just got myself my first set of decks and, and just practice. My mom wouldn't actually let me into the house for the first two years that I had decks. Um, she called it boom, boom, boom music. And I had, she had a shed at the bottom of my mom's garden and um, come rain or shine, whether it was snowing, blazing hot, raining, I would literally be in my shed with my, you know, I had probably about six vinyls at that time. Um, and I just used to practice A sides, B sides, A sides, B sides, um, and yeah, it was about two years afterwards that she actually let me in the house and I had my decks on an ironing board, um, cause I couldn't actually even afford like a, you know, a desk. I mean, it's crazy. The setup that we've actually got at home now compared to what I used to have. Um, and it just kind of snowballed from there. I was always really into radio as well. My best friend worked as a teacher in a college and she teached, um, she taught music. And she used to, <laughs> we used to fill up the back of her car with all this really expensive radio kit. And that was around the time of MSN Messenger. We had about three listeners on our radio show. Um, and every Friday we used to pack up her car, go to my mum's house, set it all up in my bedroom. Um, we had the mic, the speakers, the setup, everything. And yeah, it just kind of grew from there. And it's crazy to think that, you know, presenting in my bedroom at my mum's house has now led on for me to be presenting the defective radio show where we have, <clears throat> excuse me, like a million listeners per show now, which is just insane. So yeah, that was good times. Really good times. That's amazing. You know, she shared with me, she, we're going to ask her this question. Does she know a musical instrument? Does she know how to play? I'll let her answer that. <laughs> really put me under it now so in school I mean that I think you could either play the guitar well I chose the flute because I think that was just the easiest thing to do um yeah I played the flute in school I was do you know what going back now I really wish that I learned to play the piano because you know considering when you produce making bass lines and melodies but I was never I mean I, I was into music but nowhere near as passionate as that I was when I first started DJing, you know, it was just, it was just a lesson I had to take. And that was kind of probably just the easiest instrument that I could choose was the flute. Um, so yeah, it was the flute. Thank you, Lenny, for letting everyone know that. <laughs> well, we, this is the truth. The truth <laughs> story. You know, this is the problem with this show. <laughs> this show has, you know, there's, there's something I, I do in everyone's drink. I get them a truth serum. Yeah, I was gonna say truth serum. Exactly. So she's got truth serum right now. She has to deal with this. She's got to deal with the situation that, oh my God, he's asking me <laughs> questions. That... Okay, so, you know, of course, we want to understand, you know, decks in the, in the garden area and you're doing a radio show. But prior yeah. to that, even before you come to the era of be working and becoming part of Defected's family, there's always a beginning. Everybody has that beginning. Yeah. Take us on the road from when high school ends until that point where you start to work with the old man, Mr. Dunn. With, with Mr. D, yeah. Well, I mean, I was actually quite late starting in terms of DJing. I mean, all, all of my all of my friends were like 14, 15 when they started DJing or when they first got their first set of decks. That's old. Actually, They're older. I was right? 21. I was actually 21. That's okay. um, yeah, I, I, I was quite a late starter in that. But leading up to that, um, I kind of led probably a bit of a criminal life. I was selling drugs um, in my local nightclub when I was like 19. 
uh, maybe a little bit earlier, actually, maybe 18 to 21. So you were uh, a gear dealer. I was, I was a vibe dealer. That's what I like to call myself. Well, we, well, you know, everybody says, yo, you got gear. I love when they use that expression in the UK. You got the gear. I'm like, <laughs> no, I, you mean the pioneer gear? No, not that gear. The other gear. Yeah, the gear. <laughs> I used to basically sell ecstasy pills um, in clubs and I actually got caught and um, and they banned me for like three months and I was like, oh my God. So on that downtime when I wasn't allowed in the clubs, I was still going to after parties and a lot of my friends were DJs and I was like, okay, well, you know, said to one of my friends, you know, let's have a go. And I was rubbish, absolutely rubbish. But one of my friends worked in um, Tower Records in my local town. So I used to go in on my lunch break. Um, and just sifting through records and I was more into like trance and hard dance when I when I first got into music it was a lot later that I actually found the love for house music um and we used to go back to his house and he would just be like you know here's some records just get on with it and I mean train crash central but I just felt like I always had an ear for music which I mean later down the line we'll talk about you know how I got into a and R. I always felt like I had a good ear for music um and there was a local DJ competition in my local club. And my friends said, just go for it. And I was like, do you know what? I just will, you know. I mean, I was up against some really, really good DJs that have been playing for a much longer time than what I had. And I had these five records and I just played them A to A, A to A. And I just practiced them for like six weeks solid in my mum's shed. And when I actually got to the night, I mean, I remember being so nervous. And there was one other female and there was like six guys. And um, the other female DJ played before me and she played three out of my five records. And I remember running to the toilet. I was crying my eyes out. I was like, oh, you know, how am I going to do this now? I can't play the same records as what she's played. My friends said, just flip it and do the B-sides. And I was like, I haven't practiced the B-sides. So anyway, he was like, just flip it and just do the B-sides because you can't play the same set. Anyway, flip the B-sides. By a miracle, I actually won this competition um, and then ended up actually being the resident DJ of this club. I actually got banned for selling drugs in, um, ended up being the resident DJ. And then that led on to me being the junior booker. So I used to book, I think, I think, uh, I can't remember the first DJ that I booked. It was like a big American DJ that I first booked and didn't really have a clue what was going on, you know, looked after them. I'm always the hostess with the most S. The club really liked it. So, yeah, I ended up just moving up the ranks and ended up starting my own night on a Sunday in the VIP lounge of that club. It was called um, Sundays Are Divine. And we used to play R&B and hip hop and and uh, garage, UK garage and house. What year, um, what year would you say that was when you started that? Um, I would probably say this was 2002. So I won the competition in 2001. 2002, um, I started my own night. And I used to be out in the streets with my flyers and handing out flyers and getting people in. And just kind of, it just, at that point, it all came together. And I remember um, my first ever kind of house album that I listened to it was a Sasha and Digweed um it was the Renaissance album and again I was at an after party in London and someone played it and I was like oh my god what is this because I'd always been listening to trance hardcore and, and drummer bass jungle and they were like this is progressive house and it just I don't know it just it just touched me differently so I started collecting more progressive house vinyl and then my friend books a subliminal party in Bristol and one of the DJs dropped out and my friend said, do you want to play? And I was, it was a soulful house night. And I was like, well, I don't play soulful house. I called around all my friends. My friend was like, here, here's a, a record box of soulful house, play it. <laughs> and I was literally, obviously I'm used to playing 144, 145 BPM, whereas soulful house was like, you know, 127, between 127 and 130. And, um, I played Soulful House and I remember Barbara Tucker sounded like a chipmunk because I was playing it so fast. And the promoter at the end was like, your mix and blending is amazing, but you need to slow everything down. And then once I did that, I just went back, you know, and, and just started mixing Soulful House and just dropped the tempo. And it was like, oh my God, now I can hear the percussion and the vocal sounds, you know, where it should be. And, and I never looked back. I never, ever played a hard house set. After that, I was just on this train and that's how I fell in love with Defected because once I, I was I was a massive train spotter back in the day. Um, 
so I was just searching soulful house and defector just kept popping up and and yeah and then I started working at a record shop ah yeah can I ask you something sure when you were this is off kilt but I'm going to go back to pre you DJing and you were banned from the club what was the club yeah. called again that you were banned from the club was called Volts. okay when someone's out selling and doing this every weekend, how much normally does someone make when you're selling that kind of gear those days? I was a rubbish drug dealer because I used to tick <laughs> everyone or I used to take half of my profits myself. Oh, so you got higher in your own supply? <laughs> Yes, <laughs> I know that now. I'd be, I would have been very, very rich had I not, had I not eaten my own supply. But I kind of just did it to help my friends out, to give everyone a good time, and also so that I didn't have to pay for my own drugs. You know, and that's how it kind of worked out. You know, I'm not, I wasn't Al Capone, this big, you know, drug dealer. It, it was, it was, it was almost just for fun. But it here, here, it, feel good here, here. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would. Yeah. I would just put them out for free because I just wanted everyone to have a good like time. Gum. She's like she's handing out gum to everybody. Meanwhile, yeah, she's literally. Out of literally. Yo, yo, where's our where's our money? Exactly. Our that money. would be the thing. Then I'd have to pay my bill every week and I'd have to pay my own money from my part-time <laughs> job to actually cover everything. But then the next Friday, I do it all again. You know, I, I have fun doing it. I have fun doing it. That's why I wanted to ask how much someone makes doing this because i'm wondering if you're doing it for the for the sake of the love of being in the club it was or, exactly that or you're yeah. trying to make some money to pay a couple of bills well i'll tell you something i'll tell you something actually i actually bought my first set of decks i swapped it for a hundred ecstasy pills that's how i got my first set of decks So in, in hindsight, it was it was obviously very illegal and very silly looking back now. But had I, I mean, I wouldn't have had the money to buy my first set of decks. So yeah, I just swapped 100 pills for my set of decks. And actually, probably within about two to three months, I actually stopped dealing. And, and, and instead of buying pills, I was buying vinyl. So it was, for me, I feel like it saved my life. Music saved my life because there's only one way, Lenny, right, that you can go down that route. It's not sustainable. It was either prison or, you know, that's even, right. even worse. And yeah, I found, I, I found music. So it was, um, you know, it shaped me. If I went back, I'd probably still do it again. You know, I'm, I'm not ashamed of everything. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> you know, it, it shapes me in, into the DJ that I am now because, you know, there's no way, you know, I came from a very poor background. You know, like I said, my mum worked three jobs. Um, I want people you know, to understand that. I want people to yeah, understand that. You didn't have much money. You know, I was always on, you know, free school meals at school. Um, you know, we couldn't even afford food sometimes, you know, we'd have my auntie live down the road or, or the neighbours would give us food just so, you know, you know, literally my mum working three jobs still didn't, wasn't enough to pay the rent. And also, you know, so that my brother and I didn't go without, you know, we still always had, you know, you know, kicks on our feet and we always had bikes and, and toys and, but it, you know, it didn't always cover food. I so, what you know, expense though. How often was your mom home? Because she's working three jobs. Yeah, I mean, she used, she was a lorry driver, so she used to pick. She used to. I used to do my last lesson in school, which was PE, and my mom used to pull up outside the the play school, at like the playground, and she'd be like, you know, putting the sheet over and getting the the lorry ready for the last load. I'd finish school, I'd jump in the truck with her, then I'd go and do the last load with her, then she'd drop us off. Um, you know, then she'd go and clean toilets and, and then at weekends, she, she, she just slept all weekend, you know, and she ended up a actually having a nervous breakdown, um, because she was just absolutely exhausted. So I would go and stay with my auntie or I'd go with my dad. My dad was a lorry driver, but he worked abroad all the time. So yeah, it was like, I hardly really saw my mum. um, in most of in most of my childhood but you know we never ever went without we always had a roof over our head and food in our bellies and i think that was the most important thing so when i started djing and i had you know i could buy my first car and you know all these great things you know it's it i really appreciate and i feel so blessed because i really do 
come from nothing. And now I just want to, you know, be a good role model for, you know, all these young DJs coming through that you can literally, literally come from nothing and you can still, you know, have this wonderful life and be so blessed that the people that I meet along the journey and along the way, and I get to play in some amazing, you know, venues around the world. And yeah, it just, it almost chokes me up. You know, I just feel so blessed to, to be able to tell my story and, and to give hope, you know, you don't have to have, you know, to, to come from, a background where, you know, your parents might have money, your family might have money because you can still do it when you can have nothing, you know? Yeah. But what went into it hard, you had to work hard to still get it. Right. I, yeah, absolutely. You know, I don't take anything for granted, nothing for granted, you know, that I celebrate the small wins as well as the big wins. My problem is, is that I'm always on to the next thing, like something amazing will happen. And, you know, I just got booked for Glastonbury, which was a, which is a huge bucket list. It's a dream come true. Um, and then I'm like, okay, well, you know, what's next after that? You know, sometimes I just feel like I need to, to slow down and actually appreciate the journey. And, and it's actually sitting down and, and having these chats that, that make you realize how far that someone's actually come. Sure. So now, First record shop you told me about? Yeah. Oh my this god. Is now where officially, this is where she officially starts to step into the Yeah. So I actually so there wasn't a house section in in the record shop that I worked in, but I knew all the boys that worked in there. Predominantly the biggest seller was drum and bass and hardcore. They didn't have a they didn't have a house section at all. So I said, okay, well, I'll work for free. Um they gave me a very small budget, and at the time I was just buying um, I mean, I couldn't afford US imports. That was like much later on. Um, but I was just buying funky house bootlegs because they were like three quid each um, and defected records. So I had like my shrine, my little shrine. I only had like, I think seven or eight um, vinyls, like three or four units each. And I would literally call my friends that were either based in Bristol or in Cardiff, Newport. And I'd be like, bro, you need this. And I'd put the phone to the needle and then I'd play it and then I'd just skip through it. And they'd be like, yeah, send me a copy. And then I'd pack it up. I'd run across the road to the post office, ship it off. And then the next week, once I sold all my units, then they would, and then gradually they're like, okay, we're going to offer you a full-time job. Um, and I ended up working there probably for about a year and a half. And then I got headhunted to chemical records, which was insane because I had unlimited budget. They were just like, buy what you want. So obviously in the beginning, I'm like, you know, looking after my friends, um, all the bootlegs. And then I used to work with distributors. So I'd started importing, um, us imports from the States. And that was where for me, that was like the real soulful house. There was there was a few producers in the UK that that were amazing, but all the best soulful house came out of the States. So I would have boxes and boxes of vinyl turn up every single day with my name on it. I then have to record the A side, the B side into um, a computer system and then put the artwork in. I used to have to write, um, you know, little descriptions of what it was. And then that got sold. And then that just got shipped all back all over the world. It was amazing. And then on Mondays, I remember we used to have to actually pick the orders down in the warehouse because the office was above the warehouse. So all the vinyl used to come in. Um, and then, yeah, I used to have to pick the orders and then they'd, then, then they'd be shipped off. So I was in the thick of it, really in the thick of it. And I learned so much, you know, learning labels, producers, engineers. Um, yeah, it was, that was an amazing, amazing time in my career. And then I did my first season in Ibiza. So I kind of had to, had to give it all up. And then I worked in a record shop in Naples um, called Angels of Love. And I mean, I couldn't speak any Italian and my customers didn't speak any English, but as we all know, music is a universal language. So I just be, you know, just put the vinyl on, play it to them. And they'd be like, CC and I'll be like, CC and then wrap it up and, and off they'd go. So I did that for about six months, which, which was amazing. And I still don't know, learn, learn any Italian. I just know that. So, Bella. You, so you ended up, Ibiza of your first season. I beat that 2005. Yeah. 2005. And then on your way to Naples right after that. 
So I had a residency there. So I used to actually stay at the promoter's house and he had a record shop and a studio out at the back of the record shop. So whenever I went over, um, I would literally just spend the day working in the record shop. So I did that like every month for six months. So he would book me, fly me out from Ibiza. I'd go and play Naples and then I'd fly back. So for the first year, actually 2005, I was still working in Spin Central, but remotely. So I would buy records, get them shipped to the shop, still call my friends or they would go in and, and buy the vinyl, but that wasn't sustainable. So in 2006, after my first season in Ibiza, I moved to London uh, with my best friend. She got a job at Radio One. We literally rocked up. I had a a record box and a suitcase. We didn't know anyone. Um, and I, and I got a job. One of my distributors was from London and he was like, do you want to come and manage my shop in Notting Hill? Um, and it was called Oatmeal Records. And Aaron Ross at the time, he was the A&R at Defected. He used to come into Oatmeal Records every Saturday. So I got chatting to him. Um, and he was like, you know, we do Defected on a Tuesday at Pasha next summer come out so I was always going to do the seasons so yeah he hooked me up VIP I went and chatted to him I met Simon Dunmore um and every week you know I'd be like Simon you know can I have some promos I've, I've had a residency at a bar in the West End called Hush um and I played all defective records you know I was kind of obsessed at that point I'd probably say and my one night off I used to work six nights a week my one night off um, I used to go to Defected and that's how I met Simon. And the end of 2008, he called me into the office and he said, what are you up to next summer? I said, well, I'm going to go back and have my residency. He's like, well, we'd like you to, um, we'd like you to be events manager for Defected. Previous to that, I'd run my own parties in London with my best friend for charity. We did, uh, we had a night called Levita. Um, for breast cancer research and we had I was going to ask you about that yeah we had many amazing parties we threw them in Miami we threw them in Amsterdam we threw them in Ibiza in London the first ever La Vita party that we threw we booked 27 female DJs on a Thursday night I'd never even met any of these female DJs so when I first moved to London obviously working in the record shop I still didn't really know anyone so I said to my mum, I was like, how am I going to get myself out there? Um, we're thinking of doing a charity night. And, and it's very close to my heart, um, cancer anyway. I've lost um, quite a few members of my family. So she said, why don't you do it for breast cancer research? So we did it. And it was it was incredible. We sold this club out on a Thursday night. It was in the West End, Tottenham Court Road in London. Um, and yeah, and then we, we, just, we just started throwing parties around London just for fun. Um, and then, so I thought, okay, well, I've got some experience of throwing parties. I mean, nothing like defected, but my dad just said, you know, just, just go out there. It, you're either going to sink or swim. Right. So right. yeah, it was, it, it was hard work, but I got to, I got to, I got to do the pre-parties at Mambo. So I was warming up for like Kenny Dope, Ben, Dennis Ferrer, Shapeshifters, um, all my heroes, basically. Um, so I used to do the warm up, and then I'd go to Pasha. I'd look after the DJs from the moment that they they touched down, from the moment that they left the island, basically. So I would take them out for dinner, make sure that they, you know, needed didn't need anything. Um, took them to the club, took them to the pre party, and yeah, just kind of cut my teeth into that. By the end of that summer, that was two thousand and nine. Um, Simon flew me back to London and I was playing Ministry of Sound and I remember I was playing Kings of Tomorrow finally and it was my thing back in the day I used to get up on the decks and be like singing and you know hype man and I got up on the decks and I was singing and I had 50 of my friends in front of me they all came out to support and I remember halfway through singing I looked to the looked to the to the side and Simon was just kind of shaking his head and smiling. And then on the Monday, that was on the Saturday on the Monday, he called me and was like, I want to sign you to the DJ roster. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's the moment. That's the turning point right there. That was the turning point. Yeah. That was the turn. And he threw me straight into the deep end because my first ever international show was Columbia. 
I went to Colombia and I remember being so scared and uh, there was a big snowstorm in New York and I got stuck in Colombia for three days and I had like armed guard army outside the hotel with like AK-47s. It was like the roughest part of Colombia that I played in. Um, and yeah, that was my first ever defector show was Colombia. <laughs> The show go so well. Fearless, so fearless back then. My, and my dad, I always used to message my dad when I got on the plane, messaged him when I landed, messaged him when I got to the hotel, messaged him when I got to the club, when I finished and, you know, all of that. Um, but we never used to tell my mum where I was going because she would freak out. Um, so fearless then. You know, I'd, I'd literally be travelling everywhere on my own. For many years I did that until I got myself a tour manager. Um and then obviously I ended up going back to Ibiza in 2010. Um, first lady to be signed to Defected as well, which is insane. Um, but yeah, the rest is history, I guess. Historically speaking, the first woman to be signed as a yeah, team. Yeah. To a house record label. To a house record label to defected, yeah, because there wasn't really there wasn't really many in the UK for sure many house female DJs, so I never really had anyone to kind of aspire to to look up to. So wait, all- so who were the DJs? Women, I'll let you name them. Some of them that were playing in the circuit. Yeah, so it was all it was all hard house DJs. That's right. Hard yeah. house DJs. So Lisa Pinup, Lisa Lashes, Rachel right. Auburn. Right. Um, they were they were all my inspirations, you know, in terms of house. It wasn't until much later on. I mean, Smoking Joe, but she wasn't really on my radar. I mean, God, big up Smoking Joe, you know, she's still absolutely killing oh, it. Lisa, Lisa Loud. Um, there wasn't, yeah, there wasn't really many female house DJs, it was just, so I've always been in a boys club, always since, you know, since, since day one. I mean, now to see this wave of, of female DJs come through, uh, predominantly through lockdown, actually, it's mostly since, since lockdown. Um, But, you know, I look up to my Jane Coles. I recently booked Minx for a rooftop party that we did in Miami. Um, you know, remarkable on Defected as well, Monkey. Um, there's just so many female DJs now. Oh, now there great. is. Oh, now there is. Yeah. Now there's now there is, yeah. But it was always, you know, I was the only I was the only female on a lineup. And I was okay with that because that to me was normal. You know, going back to my mum being a lorry driver and my dad being a lorry driver, I've always been around a lot of men, always, you know. Yeah. I've got a lot of male friends. Um, so that was just that was just so normal for me. You know, it was only when it started coming out like, you know, we need diversity on lineups. I was like, oh yeah, but that was I never I never really looked into it because that was just normal for me to only be the female on a on a lineup. Or Telly, on tour with, you know, a bunch of with a bunch of guys. Telly, she's reminding me about Sarah HB from the old days. Sarah HB is was a house to, like yourself, soulful house DJ. Yeah, uh, for a long time, the early nineties. Yes, and um, Sandra Collins and DJ Heather and Monica Cruz. And Heather, Heather, exactly. Yeah, so but many, obviously, you know, we, all you guys were across the pond. We didn't, we didn't have that in the UK. You know, I used no, to have to go to. Miami Music Week to see, you know, all the US, all my favorite US DJs. Um, you know, that it was very rarely. I mean, I was lucky enough to tour with with Kenny Dope and to tour with um, you know, Dennis Ferrer and Sandy Rivera, but only because they were signed to defect it. Right. Otherwise, I wanted to see any, you know, and, and yourself, you know, I'd have to go to Miami Music Week. That was my window to actually go and listen to the music that I loved because Soulful House. It was big in the UK, but I kind of made the switch from Soulful House to kind of more Deep House. I mean, Tech House back then isn't the same as what Tech House is now. Um, But yeah, Ibiza, you'd have to go to Ibiza, but there wasn't many US, you know, house DJs that played in Ibiza. Spen, I guess. I became very, very good friends with Spen, Kerry Chandler, because Kerry played at DC10. I played quite a lot with Spen in the UK, actually, but... 
yeah, it was it was a treat if a US DJ came over to the UK to play. So I'd make sure that I'd go and see, you know, Masters of Work if they were playing at a festival, if I wasn't if I wasn't DJ myself. Sure. And of course, you know, I mean, this is all again, you were also battling at that same time when you're talking about those years, because I lived through them as well, the the other alter ego, the EDM scene. So yeah. That was that was uh, that was a hardship for the house world yeah for the traditional soulful or disco house or any of the others that have the any kind of soulful feel to it you yeah. know yeah it, it got pushed aside for this new thing around that time edm i mean david Guetta explodes with his album swedish house mafia yeah visa gets taken over because at that time i was playing space and i was a resident on the saturday night so i remember the change it was drastic yeah. it was like oh no now what what do we do yeah yeah i also feel maybe a big part when you know digital came out as well you know vinyl um because i remember defected i remember this very well defected you know, really struggled because obviously their their main business of of music. You know, we had we had to we had Ibiza and we had you know a few territories around Europe. Um, but the you know when vinyl, I mean, it's still very much alive. It's just probably more gone underground now. But I mean, I was one of the last ones to go into digital. All my friends were like, "Sam, you are crazy. Why are you still lobbying record boxes about?" But I'm like, I still like to flick. And I remember I did a photo shoot in Ibiza, and my friend had some CDJs. And there's a picture of me. I've got sledgehammer. This is an actual press shot that I use a sledgehammer, and I'm pretending to hit you know, smash up the CDJs because I would, I'm obviously coming from working in a, a record shop background as well. I was literally, you know, someone, it actually took the bar that I played in. I came back one summer and they were taken one of the Technic 1210s away and replaced it with a CDJ. And I was like, now what? What, is, what is this? What is this? So I had to retrain myself on US. Uh, no, it was CDs. It was CDs. Um, and I remember I had this big fat, slap a case wallet because I still wanted to flick through CDs, you know, and I print off, um, you know, the covers or, you know, like I'd rip it off a uh, vinyl and then print the cover off. So it's almost like vinyls, but CDs. And, uh, yeah, in the end, I mean, it was through gritted teeth that I actually, um, you know, started playing USB. And in fact, I was, I like, should have done this a long time ago. Um, yeah, well, that's when you're in it. You're already saying that, but it's the fear of the change. Yeah, yeah. I remember sure. saying this clearly. I will never play digital CDs. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't. Remember, even... I said that word. I will never. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't even read my own handwriting, so it was just a potluck every time I put a CD in the CD player. But you know. It was my rule only to only to burn off bangers. So I knew that whatever it was going to be, it was going to be a banger, good. right? You yeah. like, I'm going to make sure because, you know, and now that I realize that I get it now because the way you also bought records as a record buyer, you bought records that you knew that would be like peak of the night yeah. bangers went after yeah. another, and you wanted yeah. to fit four slots, like they yeah, got six it. records. What's my six records for that 40 minutes, yeah. one hour? I get it. And I, and no, I've heard you no play. Yes. Fillers. No floor fillers, just straight up heaters. So you get through the, that era of darkness, you know, because it's, it was a tough time for everybody that, yeah. that changeover. Yeah. When, when does it, when do you decide that you're going to step in to running a record label, becoming a, an owner of, of divine sounds? Like when is that all? Yeah. Do you know what? what? That, that was actually by complete accident that I started my label because there was really none of my peers were starting labels. Obviously it was just all the majors like defected. Um, and I was having a lunch meeting with my manager, see eight years ago, we would just turn eight. Um, I remember just having a pizza and, um, I'd had a couple of weeks off, a couple of weekends off. So I kind of went down a rabbit hole and I was like, I just want to find some new music. And I was on SoundCloud and I found this artist called Curtis Gabriel. He literally had about a hundred followers on SoundCloud. And I was like, the, the records that he was making were insane. And I was kind of a bit frustrated. And I said to my manager, 
I was actually sad for him. I was like, he's not getting, you know, he's banging on people's doors because I DM'd him on uh, on SoundCloud. Um, and he was like, you know, I, no record labels are answering me back. I've got all these demos. Um, so my only outlet outlet is is SoundCloud to put to put my records out. Um, and like I said, starting a record label wasn't, it wasn't even a, a thing then. And I was just really sad for him. And my manager said, okay, so why don't you start a record label? Why don't you sign him? And I was like, can I do that? Is that even a thing? Um, and literally my dad thought the name Divine Sounds and um, literally the next day we had the name, we worked on the logo, you know, we set up all the social handles and I wrote Curtis and I was like, I really want to sign your record. And he was like, okay, let's do it. Signed it. And it went to number one on track source. And we were so proud. We were so, so proud of him. I actually started working the record label with two of my best friends. Um, and it was just so much fun. I mean, we went to, we went to IMS, we did, uh, we did ADE, we did winter music conference. We sat in on all the, you know, all the seminars, all the talks of our little notepads. And we just asked questions, you know, we were like sponges. And obviously being in the industry at that point, like over 10 years, knowing all the right people. I remember having a meeting at, uh, at Shoreditch House with a distributor and they were like, you know, we can, you know, deliver your record. But I wanted to do everything. So I used to input every single bit of the record, all the best data, all the, you know, the back end of the record. I would sit there, I'd come up with the, um, you know, the catalogue number. we sit there, we... We would have A&R meetings every week at my house. We drank a lot of wine in those A&R meetings. When I look back at some of the records that we signed, we're like, yeah, I think we were quite drunk when we signed that record. But we also signed some incredible records as well. Um, and it was just so much fun. And we were just winging it. We just did everything with and still do with, you know, with my heart on my sleeve. And I think for me, because I was in the thick of it with Defected. I wanted to take all the best bits from Defected, but without kind of copying what Defected did, but also the, the business model of Defected, that's what we put into Divine Sounds. So, you know, we started throwing events all over the world and, um, you know, we really wanted to tell a story. I wanted to give a platform. I mean, our ethos still to this day is, you know, good people plus good music equals good times. And that's the fundamental of any record label of, of, of any party. Um, and we just, we just did it for fun and it's still for fun. You know, I didn't ever want to make any money out of the label. I just wanted that to give the artists a platform and so that we can shout about their music and how much of an incredible talented artist they are in it. And it's family vibes at divine sounds, which is a, which is a big thing that's affected. You know, we're a big family. And family is where my next question was leading. Thank you very much. <laughs> you all remember when she set up that posting, she got married. <laughs> We're going to go there. <laughs> no, we going there. You're We're all going. saying, like we all do, congratulations. We love you. We all <laughs> last forever. You know, everybody's writing their comments, thousands of comments. <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> take the pictures together, the wedding and we yeah. our house and all yeah. that. Yeah. How, how does one become family at home? How does that all translate from being the international DJ producer, remixer and label owner and of course charity event organizer and such and such to yeah. now having normal, trying to have a balance because as I've always said, it's a balancing act. Try and also have a normal life. How does that work for you? You know, how that's the thing, it didn't work, hence why I am divorced now. Um, it 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 didn't work, and because I'd always put my career first, and I found it very difficult to switch off when I was at home. You know, he was a touring DJ as well. Um, and we were literally like passing ships in the night. I was touring Europe, the UK, he was touring America. Um and it was actually lockdown when, when lockdown hit and you just kind of look at each other and think it was cool while we were both on the road because we hardly saw each other. Um, but when lockdown hit and we had to spend a lot of time together, it actually wasn't where my heart was. Um, 
so shortly, shortly after that, we divorced. It was amicable. It was cool. Um, but I just, yeah, I just, I just had always, I, I just couldn't get that balance right. And I had a nervous breakdown when we first went into lockdown, when the pandemic first hit in 2020, I found it very difficult to relate to reality because I'd been on tour for so long and I was partying a lot. I was drinking a lot. I was doing all the bad stuff that you shouldn't do. Um, and I just kind of woke up one morning and thought I need to get sober because this isn't healthy. It's making me depressed. I distanced myself from my friends, from my family, from my husband at, at that point. Um, and yeah, I got myself a life coach and, you know, I had to dig very, very deep into actually who Sam was because I'd lost myself. Um, and it's very easily to do that when you're a DJ, you know, you, you pretty much get paid to party unless you're very, very strong minded. And I didn't have any willpower, you know, I'd be dragged off to after parties. I'd miss <laughs> we parties. know that. We know that from your gearing days at the beginning. Oh my gosh, I was cr I was wild, absolutely wild back in the day. Because I didn't I didn't care too much for myself, I guess. When I when I went deep, I didn't really care for myself. I give so much to everyone all the time. And I never actually had my release. And in the end, this, it just, it was very, very toxic. And I was depressed, you know, and I'm not ashamed to admit that I hold my hands up now because I hope that I can help, you know, this is why I bang on so much about being a good role model to these, to this new wave coming through. Cause it's really important. Um, I've actually got a really cool story. There's a drum and bass DJ that I absolutely adore. He'll working on called Goddard working on a record with him. And I saw him at Ibiza closings last summer and we were talking and, and I used to drink for confidence. That's what it boiled down to. I didn't have the confidence. Um, so I used to, you know, make a few tequilas as you do, but then as I'm, playing I had a tour manager that um yeah I used to party a lot with my tour manager which it's super important to have a tour manager that probably doesn't drink that doesn't party to keep you on the right track I mean I'm not putting all the blame on my tour manager because hey I well you know my story I love to party back well, in they, the assist, they assist on making it much more comfortable and easier yeah. for you to yeah. partake in having a party Yes, exactly. And when you get two party heads together, it's just carnage. Danger, Mrs. Robinson. Danger. 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 Very, very dangerous. But, you know, th that lifestyle of taking drugs and, and drinking alcohol and flying and, you know, still trying to, it, I found like I was almost being fake, you know, because I was drinking because I didn't have the confidence. And then, purveying on online that you know my life is so perfect look I'm flying all these places I'm sending out shows and this and that but I wasn't happy Lenny I really wasn't I was so unbelievably depressed and sad and I didn't know why and then you you blame yourself it's like well you can't be sad because you're more blessed than some people you know, that you're flying all over the world and, and you're playing music and you, you know, you're getting to see some incredible places. So I felt guilty. So there was all these, I just kind of just beat myself up to the point where I had a nervous breakdown. I was in hospital and Sam, Sam, can I ask you a question? Sure. Very importantly, when someone says they have a nervous breakdown, what exactly happened? My whole body and my brain just shut down. And I remember I was just on the sofa, curled up in a ball, hysterically crying. And I just wanted to, I actually, um, I actually tried to take my own life. That's how bad it got. I was in a, and, that, and it's not sad tears, it's actually happy tears. Because no, it's a life-changing moment. This is life-changing moments. I yeah. want you to share this with everybody, yeah. how changing yeah. this is for you. I came out the other side, but I was in a very, very dark place. And I didn't want to, you know, for three weeks, I didn't even shower. I didn't get out of bed. I didn't clean my teeth. I didn't eat and all my friends and my family, I hid it from them. I hid it from them. And it was only my agent 
um, that got through to me because he had been through something similar. And then every day it was like, it, the only way you can describe it is being in the bottom of a pit and you can see up and it's light, but you just don't know how to, you, you don't know how to reach out for help. So you just end up spiraling further and further and further down to the point where you just don't want to be alive. You just, you just don't want to wake up in the morning. And, um, and I hid that very well. I didn't, I didn't tell anyone how I was feeling for a very, very long time until I kind of admitted it to my agent. And, um, that's when the recovery process started. I got myself a life coach. You know, I reached out to my, to my very closest friends, to my family, to my dad. Um, and I told them how I was feeling. And that was a massive weight lifted because I didn't have to hide anymore. I didn't have to live in shame anymore, you know, because to admit that you have a problem with drugs is why people keep taking drugs because you, you, a, you don't feel like you actually have a problem and B when you, when you kind of realize you do have a problem, you actually don't want to admit it because you feel weak and you're weak already, you know? So that was a big turning point. And, um, I did some NA meetings. I told all my friends around me that, um, you know, you want to drink and party? That's cool. But I'm, you know, not on that vibe. Don't do it in front of me. And everyone was so supportive. Sure. there was a big turning point for me. It took me 18 months and I had to take myself back to things that happened to me in my childhood and work through that, which was very uncomfortable. And also, Lenny, for the first time, I don't remember the last time when I actually admitted that I wanted to go sober, that I hadn't had a drink in more than 10 years. Every weekend I drank, every weekend that I took drugs. And um, well, you got to realize everyone, I want everybody to understand this. When you're in this scene and you're playing, it's all there. Yeah. It's, a, it's like a water. It's like having free water. But it's, hey, well, what do you need? What do you want? We'll yeah. give you everything. They throw it at you. So if you say you're weak, you're going to summarize right into that stuff immediately. No problem. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. Like, and it's a vicious circle when you're doing it every weekend when you're, I was drinking to get over my hangover. I was still drunk to get my flight. Then I was drinking when I got there to get over my hangover. Then I'd get home and I'd call a party on at my house because I wanted to carry the party on because then that's when I can really let my hair down because I was working. I convinced myself, you know, that I needed my release. And it's just then you take four days to get over and then you're back on a flight and you're out again and then you're back in the party mix. And I did that for 10 years. You know, I didn't look well. My head wasn't well. It was just very, 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 very toxic. Very, very toxic. And um, and now I don't drink at all when I DJ. I can't even remember the last time that I did drugs before I played. I mean, I'm talking years, years and years and years. Um, and I just made a conscious effort. I went, I did 100 days sober in 2019 and loved it. I had so much clarity. Oh, I bet. In fact, I've actually written a record called Clarity from that time, from when I actually did my 100 Days Sober, uh, which will be coming out later on in the year. And, yeah, I just had so much clarity. And then every time I just tried to go a little bit longer, a little bit longer, to the point now where I literally couldn't think of anything worse of having a drink while I was DJing now. I couldn't couldn't think of anything worse. Good for you. Now, on the other side of all this, she has a new love in her life. I do. And the sun, see now the sun does shine. We've got the through the thunderstorms, <laughs> we've got through all the gray. And yeah. So also, let's all give her a big congratulations. She moved <laughs> house, she moved up to the north of England. I'm not gonna tell you where. Yeah. But it's somewhere near near near, possibly near Manchester, near the in the area. <laughs> it's near an airport. That's all you need to know. <laughs> So you can find happiness after oh, you. Oh, Lene, I, and it was by complete accident because I'd kind of just given up, not given up hope on love at all because I'm a very loving and open person. And I kind of let, you know, let people in. If they, if they hurt me, then, you know, I dust myself off and I go again. Yes, see ya. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but I actually walked into a bar in Ibiza 
and he was in there and we just hit it off. We just hit it off and we've been inseparable ever since. He is a DJ and producer himself. He has an impeccable ear for music and he has taught me so much. You know, I was kind of very tunnel vision with when it comes to house music, I guess. I love all genres. Um, but I mean, he's opened me up to so many different, I mean, there's the umbrella, right, Lenny? And then you've got all these different subgenres of house. Tell me about but it. It's he crazy. he inspires me so much to be a better person. You know, I'm in the gym now. I'm looking after myself. I'm, you know, way more on it with my music. I'm, And it's amazing that he can travel all over the world with me as well. So we're going back to places where I didn't remember because I was too hungover or too drunk. And I'm going back to these places and, you know, it's just like I'm like a kid in a candy store when I go to the States now. You know, I've been to San Francisco maybe seven times. The time just gone a few months ago, we went to, um, you know, where the, the what's it, Pier 39, where all the seals are, you know, the Golden Gate Bridge, and we do all this cool stuff, and we go out for nice dinners, and he he's a real big foodie, whereas I was just like, eat burgers wherever I can at the airport, you know. Oh, just no, just no, 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 you need to sit down and eat right. So bad, so bad. Oh, God, um, it's so bad. Oh so, God. so bad. So now it's just, yeah, I, you know, I've, I've met my soulmate and I get to enjoy this lifestyle with my forever partner next to me and we and we get to do it all together and it's just, it's insane. It's so incredible. We've just got books to do a back-to-back -back set at Glastonbury as well. So it's going to be our first back-to-back -back set. So, yeah, I'm just, everyone's like, oh, my God, you're so happy. And he just, he just makes me smile. He makes me really happy. So, what's, so tell everyone his name. His name is Matthew and his DJ and producer name is Cash Money. Um, he, yeah, plays Garage House. He's just, he's just such an incredible person. And he's, he's changed my life. He's changed my life for the better. You know, I want to be a better person. I want to be, you know, a good stepmom to be to, to, to the children. And we've got dogs and, you know, we've moved up north and yeah i just feel like you know at 41 years old you're never too old to find love you know so i just can't wait to spend the rest of my life with him and have someone there that supports me he's my number one you know cheerleader if i'm having a bit of a shitty day he's there to pick me up or he's my voice for reasoning i'll be like oh i don't know whether to do this show and he's like yeah i think you should do it and yeah he's just he's yeah he's just my everything and and I never thought that I would. I've never been in love until now, you know. And, and you. you're never too late to fall in love. So, yeah, I'm really happy. Here's the thing that I'm just going to leave with you. Hopefully there's no competitiveness between you and him so that you work no. as one, as you work as one unit. Not Absolutely. Separate. Yeah, we're building an empire. He he doesn't even want to be at my level. He says, I see what you go through. There's no way that I want that. He's happy to play out once a month, produce his music, and um, yeah, and just and be my little roadie. So and I'm his roadie. He's my roadie. He's my roadie. He's yeah. the road warrior. He's the one that step move everybody out of the way, get you in there, set you up. That's it. Not that I need any help from any man or woman for that. For no that. man or man. Yeah, man. yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. It's amazing. Yeah, he's he's put a smile back on my face and, and he's uh healed my heart, which um which I love him forever for. And we love you too. Oh yes. Lenny, thank you so much for having me on. I think we covered a lot with you, and I'm so glad you broke through to tell us about the moments of of what darkness can do. See, I try yes. to tell us everybody, you can have all the money and fame, but if you're a miserable SOB inside, it doesn't nothing. mean nothing. Nothing, nothing. Right? I always say, if you have got a roof over your head and you've got food in the fridge and you're warm, everything else is a bonus. And someone that loves you. And someone that loves you, yeah. But if you love yourself, you're well, almost- starting with, well, starting with them. Well, first you got to look in the mirror and you love what you see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you don't, there's a problem because you well, got first thing in the morning I don't because my hair's wild, you know, that, that whole vibe. But yeah, from after about 11 a.m. I love myself. <laughs> till, till the evening and then very bed and start. Yeah. Off <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Vine. Do not leave us. All of you next week, we're bringing you another Londoner. 
who I know a very, very long time from Catch a Groove Records, his record shop, Ricky Morrison. Oh, wow. Bring That's... Ricky in to talk about his life with Fran Sidoli, M&S, coming strong back with True House Stories. Nice. Come back here next week. See you all. Mr. Vine, God bless you, Glastonbury, and the rest of your summer, as I know you're going to rock it. And to all of you, Avita Zan, good to knock. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lenny.